All right, well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Pasimian Valley, where technically it should be a more consistent show, but we don't talk about that. So with me today, we have three fantastic Redditors. I actually looked around for the most handsome of them. Uh, it's a pity that video isn't available, but uh, you just have to trust me on that one. So uh, today we're going to be talking about the new post-rotation uh, decks and how we feel about each and every one of them. So I'm going to start by going alphabetically and introducing everybody. Uh, first we'll have Blackguard. What do you have to say, Blackguard? Hey, how's it going? I'm back. Um, last season was pretty good. I finished off getting points at NAIC, which was a lot of fun. And I am super stoked for a new rotation. All right, next is Lycanator. I'm not sure if that's the way you pronounce it, but let's go with that. Yeah, that's good. All right, um, what do you want me to say? All right, well, uh, yeah, like I said, uh, on Reddit, I'm Lycanator, and I haven't gotten seriously into competitive. I love to keep up with the meta, but this year I really do plan on, uh, you know, trying to get that world's invite. All right, sounds good. And finally is Mr. Team Scoop TCG. Hey, what's up, guys? Back for my second time. Uh, super excited. Uh, you know, just uh, trying to win some cups this year, finally. <laughs> At this point, actually winning league challenges might be difficult. Uh, in my area, probably. It seems like it's going to be. All right, sounds good. Well, either way, I've been thinking of ways we could actually tackle each and every deck. So I decided that the best way would probably just need to be in sort of like a rapid-fire way. So... Uh, I'm thinking I'm, the best way would be actually go by sets. So I'm going to just go by set, and then we'll look at the few cards. You give me your opinion on what do you think. All right, so the first thing that the first set that we could actually play with is obviously Sun and Moon. And um, Sun and Moon has a few decent cards, but some of them I think don't have too much of potential, like Lorantis. Uh, so the first one I want to talk about is probably Decidueye, which at one point in time was actually the BDIF. So what do you guys feel about Decidueye? Uh, I'm actually testing that one right now, uh, doing a Decidueye Zorark. Um, I mean, it's like a solid tier two. I'm not going to call it tier one, but it's not bad either. Yeah, I like, I like Decidueye a little bit. I've seen it played, and I think it's very okay. I think it kind of falls into the category of, I'm playing Zorark, and I could have a different partner, but I have Decidueye. So, yeah, it's alright. It's, it's a little slow. Because two attachments on the stage two, but the ability is really good, and that's not going to change. I think one thing that's a little bit undervalued is um, probably the fact that it helps you it helps you hit a little bit of the better numbers. So you know you cap out with one fifty with Zark, and then you just hit that one seventy, which is a lele. Over time, you could probably start hitting bigger numbers. But apart from that, yeah, it is at stage two, so it does have difficulty sometimes working out. Uh, let's start with uh, Lycanator. All right, I was just going to say, it, it, I feel like I was testing out, I've been testing out since uh, before rotation happened, and it just, it loses too much, I think, with Bridget and Puzzle. I think those are two things that made that deck super consistent. Um, so I think, you know, as much as we, you know, we have fan club, but I think there's no, really no replacement for Puzzle. All right, uh, Blackguard? I think one of the other problems is that it's competing with Ninja GX. And the, the whole Greninja line obviously does damage when it evolves, so it's com it does a similar thing, but it has Brooklet Hill in addition to, ne to Nest Ball and Fan Club and everything else to search out Froakies. And I think the attacks on Greninja are a little better, and it can use um, Aqua Patch. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, all right, so moving on. Uh, at one point in time, this deck was uh, pretty decent, but uh, its future is a little unsure right now. So what about Espeon? I haven't actually run into a yeah. single Espeon since rotation. Like, I, I, I have a feeling, like, it could be good, especially considering, you know, Buzz, Garb, Shrine. Uh, I feel like it could have a decent matchup against that, but um, I'm honestly really surprised we haven't run into it. I feel like it could be good also because of the fact that it one-shots a loaded Rayquaza with a choice ban which is one thing I loved about Espeon since it was a Sun and Moon card. You know, the meta was still heavy with 180 HP attackers like Volcanion. So I I'm interested to see if that could still work. Yeah, the biggest thing is losing Garbatoxin means that you just lose to Zoroark harder than even before because Espegarb already didn't beat Zoroark consistently, and now we just lose the biggest way to do that. Right, that, that makes sense. All right, so... Yeah. Uh, from Sun and Moon. I was gonna say, oh, go ahead. 
I was going to say, I just feel like it, it's lost its best matchups. And especially with uh, Buzzwool, like, dropping down and play a little bit. Uh, you know, you're not going to hit that weakness as much as you'd like to. Um, Absolutely. I haven't really tested it against Malamar, but I'm pretty sure it's not going to go well for Espeon. No, Don yeah, Wings so is a card. Malamar has a bunch of one-prizers that are also psychic, so that sort of hurts too. Either way, um, if from Sun and Moon, is there anything else you guys would like to tackle? If not, we're just going to move on to Guardians Rising. Uh, I feel like in a couple months, or maybe next month, I'm not sure when it's supposed to re- release, uh, but when we get that new Sogaleo GX, I feel like Sogaleo is going to see a little bit more play, because uh, it's that busted one with the ability uh, where your Pokemon have no weakness, and then... For a DCE, it accelerates energy and does 120 damage. Yeah, that, right. that card has a lot of potential. All right, sounds good. So we'll watch out for that. Next, we're obviously we're looking at Guardians Rising. And uh, Guardians Rising, it'd be hard to look at without looking at Garbodor. So what have you guys been working Garbodor with? For our- uh, a lot of people right now, the big one is uh, Zoroark Garbodor. One Worlds, um, people are still playing it post-rotation. Uh, it topped that uh, special event in uh, Australia. I, I don't really see it going anywhere too fast, because especially right now in this new meta, a lot of people are playing heavier item counts because, you know, we don't have that Bridget anymore, so they're playing b- more ball search cards, which are items which help fuel uh, the trash lanch. Right, so there's more, like, ball search cards, so Nest Ball, Ultra Ball, Timer Ball. And even in decks that don't want to play all those cards, they even run uh, four Acro Bikes to re- help uh, consistency-wise. Right. right. And if we have State Shoes coming back, Rare Candy is also a thing. One thing that I, I do have to know is that most decks have been cutting a uh, field blower, which is interesting. Yeah, with with Parallel City rotating and Garbatox and Garbador rotating, like you're pretty you don't really have anything that necessarily has to be bumped this turn. Like there's Shrine of Punishment, um, which I, I can see you advocating a field blower for that, but like, everything else, uh, you know, like a choice band, they're going to get their turn out of it that they need it to get the knockout the turn they play it. So just getting rid of that, like, doesn't really help all that much. Um, so I, I can see why people have been cutting it, because there's not really anything that you necessarily need to get rid of right now. Right, the only I think thing that's that... a big one. Yeah. Yeah, but trying to punch me can be bumped by a counter stadium. For example, a Devoured Field or a Brooklet Hill, so you don't need a Field Blower. The only thing you really need to Blower is like a Wishful Baton in the Rayquaza matchup. But even then, it's like, how are you finding it on the turn you need it? Yeah, uh, that's a good point. So, um, actually, earlier in last year's season, probably the first third, uh, there was a deck called Drampa Garb, using it in different ways. Uh, like I've been playing it expanded, not really standard. Uh, yeah, it's, it's still good. Finally, I think the biggest card left that we have to talk about from Guardians Rising, obviously other than Lele, which is a standard card now, uh, is uh, Metagross. So at the beginning of this post-rotation, Metagross was gaining a lot of hype, as it does every so often, because it's just a fat 250 you know, heavy monster. Uh, have you guys tested it out? Have you guys felt anything from it? I have actually been testing Metagross a lot. It's kind of like one of my pet decks, and I really, really like it in this format. It's It sets up pretty well like against what you'd expect because you have just you run four Nest Balls, and I run two Steven's Decision that I use on like the first or second turn. That way you can just get Metagross candy in hand, and since people are playing only a few Judge as opposed to like four in in most decks, you have a better chance for Steven or for Algorithm to stick. And then once you get two or three Metagross set up, you have that thing that Metagross does where it just lives off the board and doesn't really care about what's in his hand and nothing in the format kills it. I haven't run into too much Metagross, but I find when I do it's pretty scary because, 
you know, this is almost nothing in the meta that can one shot it. And, you know, Metagross does that thing where it max potions and just, just does not want to let you take a single prize. So to me, that's a scary matchup. I never played it back in, uh, and it's like when it came out and, uh, Probably won't be playing it now, but I think uh, it's definitely going to be big in the meta. Yeah, I haven't really tested it or played against it, but a big, fat, beefy 250 HP that can heal with healing cards. You know, and like they said, you, you can't really one-shot it unless, like, you're Rayquaza or, like, a fire deck. Yeah, so Rayquaza you, is, like, not gonna have a bad matchup. Rayquaza Vigavol just sets up like nine energies and just kills everything on your board and you're just sad. Other than that, the only right. real loss you take is if they kill all your Veldoms. Which believe, can't happen because you're still a stage two. I believe your Metagross also can't knock out the Vigavol if you want to get go that way. Because Unless Vigavolt you run two Delos. Because steel or metal. Uh, so going a little bit deeper into Metagross though, if you guys were to play it, which variant would you play? Because I know fellow Redditor ELB95 is in love with Sogaleo Metagross and actually beat me a few times on uh, PTCGO while I was laddering, which uh, sucks. But either way, uh, what do you guys think is the best partner for Metagross or is it just like a straight Metagross sort of thing? I run four Metagross GX and Baby Attackers. Because Metal has some of the best baby attackers in the format right now. I run one of the Dust Main promo, because Dust Shot is ridiculous. And one of the Registeel from the new set. Because 120 to anything with an ability is really good. It two shots Zoroarks and kills Hoopas. Alright, sounds good. So, uh, I think that's about all for Guardians Rising. Next, we're moving on to Burning Shadows. So, for Burning Shadows, you know, obviously there was the former world champion Gardevoir. Uh, what do you guys feel about Gardevoir? Because there are some characteristics that are similar to Metagross. You know, it's a beefy attacker, and at times it can even hit harder. But at the same time, you know, Metagross has Algorithm GX that helps smooth out your hands, while Gardevoir doesn't really have that. Uh, Sylveon Gardevoir right now, I feel, is like in a pretty decent position with uh, as big as Rayquaza Vickavolt is. Um... It, you know, it's still Gardevoir, you know, stuff has to have energy on it, and that's what Gardevoir loves. I feel like Gardevoir is going to be possibly, not not too sure, one of the best decks in format once that Alolan Ninetales comes out. Because that card is, like, crazy good as a partner. You know, you got the Alolan Vulpix to search out the cards you need, maybe like a Gardevoir and a Ninetales. Then Ninetales' ability gets you those rare candies, uh, choice bands, whatever it is you need. So I feel like Gardevoir, even though it's okay now in the future, it could be a, a ton better. Yeah, I like the Ninetales because it basically takes the old, like, just a Alolan Vulpix Guardi build of the deck and makes it strictly better, which is always really cool. Right. Uh, I think so. You're, pretty much everybody's in agreement that uh, it's worth keeping. And at least keeping in mind, but also keeping it in your binder in case uh, Alolan Ninetales actually becomes really good. Yeah, the, the only problem yeah, with Gardevoir and... is that it doesn't strictly beat Rayquaza, because Rayquaza always has a chance to just set up faster than you and kill everything. And also losing Glade is a really big deal, because that was just one of the best cards in the deck. Do you guys feel that the baby Gardevoir that's going to come out next set with an attack similar to Glade would do anything? Or is that just... A poor replacement. Not a fighting type. Uh, so the yeah. baby Gardevoir I'm talking about is a fairy type. Uh, and it has a similar attack to the old Gallade, where if you play a supporter, it does more damage. I believe it does the exact same amount of damage. Obviously, you don't hit for weakness on uh, Zorax, but do you think it's still worth a consider? I would say so, because just like Gallade was a good one prize attacker, uh, it would fill the same function. I mean, it doesn't have the premonition ability, and all like you were saying too, it, it doesn't hit that weakness on like Zoroarks or anything else weak to uh, fighting. Uh, but you know, it it will be a good, decent one prize attacker. All right, sounds good. So next is obviously Galissapod, which you know. In many a sense, it still lives on, as we've seen with Pramawat's uh, winning, cup-winning list. Uh, what do you guys have been feeling about Zoark? Uh, not Zoark, Galissapod. 
I actually really like this card. It was one of my favorite decks to run back when it came out. I thought it was extremely consistent. Um, I have been playing a ton with Galissopod, both the Galissopod Garbodor and Zoropod, and both of the decks are extremely consistent. Uh, grass hits for you know Zygarde as it's not it's not too big, but you know people do play it. It hits Zygarde for weakness. Um, I feel like I'm missing one, uh, <laughs> but. I still think it's it has a really good place in the meta. I'm just kind of Zoropod is uh, like, definitely something people look at. Yeah, Zoropod yeah. is still like the most consistent, versatile deck in the format, and that's just not going to change. It's just a good deck. Yeah, it, it that's my main deck right now that I'm playing. And uh, thinking about it, we actually skipped a card from Guardians Rising uh, in the form of Lycanroc GX. Uh, which Galissapod does uh, one shot. All right, that's the one I was forgetting. <laughs> yeah, All right, perfect. Like, that, that card's a big deal. Uh, so yeah. one of the more annoying things that have been coming out from the pulse rotation, at least for me, is actually spread decks. Uh, have you guys been having success with spread decks? If not, you know what exactly are you looking out for? Oh, I see um, nobody's been playing spread decks. Uh, my yeah. roommates played a little uh, bit with Shrine decks on TCGO. They're okay. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> all right. Either way, I guess it's not a popular to topic to talk about. Anyway, all right. So moving on from uh, Burning Shadows is obviously Shining Legends, which is a big turning point for many of us last season. And obviously the one card we have to talk about is Zoroark. The only card. Card's just broken. Like... Great attack, uh, great draw power, especially in this meta where we don't have a whole lot of good draw support besides, like, Cynthia. Uh, it, it just gets you cards, and it hits hard. And uh, I don't know why nobody was playing with it earlier, but with the, um, the, uh, the stadium that uh, adds the extra 10 damage, uh, so with the choice band, now we're hitting 160. Uh, with the Kikui, we're hitting 180, which will one-shot a Lele. It'll help you one-shot uh, a Rayquaza if you need to. Uh, and I'm probably missing a few others. Uh, specifically for that point, I think I saw, at least last season, uh, people were actually playing Reverse Valley because uh, the Var Field would help out your opponent if they were playing uh, Zorak too. So Reverse Valley really was a one-sided buff to you unless your opponent was playing uh, metal. So I don't right. think that's necessarily um, a new... Well, word. and... So, like, when Zoroark first came out, like, at least for me, maybe I'm just wrong, but I didn't see a whole lot of people playing it with Reverse Valley. Uh, it was mostly Parallel City, uh, you know, for, like, the mirrors and such, was actually the preferred stadium, uh, which that probably has a lot to do with it as well. Um, the, the reason most people played Parallel City and Zorak was just to avoid having it played on you. I know that was the reason I played it. Yeah, right. And just winning mirrors. The reason people started picking up Reverse Valley is mainly because of Baby Buzzwool. 130 became a much more relevant number. Right. All right, so in terms of partners, so we've obviously looked at uh, Galissapod briefly. We've Actually, we haven't discussed Garvoir. We've discussed Decidueye. And we haven't discussed Lycanroc yet. So, so far, working at a decent level of success for you guys. Well, Zoro Garb is still good. Zoro Pod is still really good. And Zoro Rock is still really good. So I think, like, every build of Zoro Arc that was good before rotation is still good. They all lost some tools, but it's Zoro Arc, so it just kind of gets over it. All right, so how about this? I'm just going to name partners, and all three of you are going to say good or bad at once, and we'll just go like sort of like a head count sort of thing. So let's start with Zoro Gardevoir. Okay. Decent. Come I'll on, say man. Decent. Say good or bad. <laughs> Either way. Okay, uh, next, uh, Zoroark Shift Tree. Uh, bad. I want to say bad. I like it. All right. How about Zorark Bennett? Good. Bad weakness. Be great, uh, but loses the mirror. All right. And finally, at least at least in my mind, the last one is Zorark Lucario. 
want it to be good. Not bad. All right, cool. It, so let's move. It's a meta call. It preys uh, on Zoro heavy metas. Yeah, sounds good. So moving on, <clears throat> we have to look at Crimson Invasion. So Crimson Invasion, much like Zoro, uh, much like Shining Legends, really has one card that we have to look at, and obviously that's Buzzwool. So at one point in time, it was called a BDIF, but after losing Max Elixir and Strong Energies, uh, what do you guys feel about the deck? Well, the I mean, it's, buzz it's wool. still Buzzwool, so you still have access to the Beast Rings. Um, I, I think it dropped down a tier, uh, but it's still not a bad deck, and uh, I've seen a lot of people uh, still playing uh, Buzzwool Garbodor, which, you know, Garb is still busted. Um, so, like, the main strategy now that I can see with it is, like, you want that first Buzzwool to get knocked out. That way you can turn on your Beast Rings and just Beast Ring and win. Right. Yeah, yeah. I pretty much agree with that. The baby buzzwall is like ten times more relevant than the GX. Like I haven't run into very many GXs, and also what you're saying, sledgehammer is like a really scary attack, and it's it's even harder to avoid it when they're only playing single prize attackers. You know, because I, you know unless you can find a way to knock out two of their one prizes in one turn, you're pretty much gonna get hit with sledgehammer. So Honestly, one yeah. modification I've seen since post rotation is um people have actually been starting to play DCEs in Buzzwell just so that they could more easily power up a Lycanroc. Uh is that a sort of modification you guys agree with or is it something that you you feel is just an uh, oversight? Interesting cuz Buzzwell just doesn't want DCE on it ever. Which is kind of the reason why Buzzwolf's Orwark has never been a deck. So, I don't know, maybe if it's like a fighting hybrid with like Zygarde GX and a bunch of other stuff, then I could see it. But if it's just Buzzwolf Lycanroc, then yeah. I mean, I can see why they're doing it, just to get value out of Claw Slash a little easier, since once again we don't have Max Elixir. Uh, so... Otherwise, you'd have to put three fighting energy on a uh, lichen rock instead of just two attachments. Um, so, I, I mean, I can kind of see why, but I don't know. Like, you know, you're never going to put it on a buzz on a buzz wool. Yeah. So at least one explanation I was given was for uh, because most of the cards in buzz wool actually have a retreat cost of two. Uh, instead of, you know, attaching twice if you can't find your Switch, your Guzma, your Escape Rope, you would just attach your DC and retreat at once. Granted, that's that's not something that you would hope for, but it's just uh, a little thing you could do. Yeah, but to argue against that, I could say that your DCEs could just be more slots for Escape Rope. All right. Uh, so, actually, although Crimson Invasion was mainly the Buzzwell show, there was one card that people have been finding some level of hype for, which is actually Sil Valley GX. Have you guys worked out with that card? Have you guys worked anything out that seems interesting, at least on paper or in, in play? I think it's too slow. I don't think it hits hard enough. Yeah, it's too hard to get three energies on it. Like it has a really good right. ability. I remember before it was announced, people were like, oh my god, so many people are going to play this. And then it just it saw, like, no play. And like I said, I think it's just too slow to keep up with the meta. Yeah. I mean, it. if you look at the attacks, they're pretty much all similar to Lycanroc, but Lycanroc's ability is just way more useful than Silvalli's ability. All right, cool. So now let's move on to Ultra Prism. So Ultra Prism... Uh, there were a few decent cards, and at least one archetype had a lot of hype going into its first regionals, which was Dustmane Necrozma with Magnus Zone. Uh, recently, we've seen that in Melbourne, it took second place, which is a good finish. And uh, what do you guys feel about the deck in general? I feel like it's a real deck now for the first time. Yep. <laughs> it, was, it was a little too slow yeah. before. Uh, after all the hype kind of died down, I don't think anyone played it for a cool minute. 
Uh, but I think the meta is definitely slow enough that it's 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 definitely a threat. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that. I think at least one of the neatest things is that most other decks have like situational Okos, and this one just doesn't. So it doesn't mean the Krasma is obviously really strong, but even uh, the Aga GX, you can't really, you can't really not respect that GX attack, which just gives your opponent another turn. And for certain decks like Buzzwell, who rely on that Beast Ring, it could just really screw with uh, your game plan. That goes crazy good. That's my favorite GX attack. But I actually haven't seen it used much. Just because it doesn't... The only significant things it knocks out are like things like Vikavolt. With a choice ban, it can hit Ray, which is pretty good. Um, but I'm actually surprised there's not more of it. Yeah, with Timeless, uh, I think the strategy is to take a one prizer down and then take your extra turn to use Duskmane to one-shot something big and just leave them like basically without a board and you just took three prizes. Right. All right. So moving on. Actually, is there anything else from Ultra? I don't think so. In any case, let's just move on to Forbidden Light. So Forbidden Light brought a few buffs to Buzzwool in, in form of Baby Buzzwool. Uh, have you guys found any success with a straight baby buzzwell deck sort of like the buzz shrine that won seniors division division is makes it just a little too weak uh so apart from buzz shrine one of the at least the fan favorite for worlds was actually zygarde gx played by clive awe if i remember right and uh although it does lose a few cards like uh scorchinger what do you guys feel about the card? Card. Happy week to psychic is really cool. Week to grass, no? Yeah, week to grass. I just so... think. Go ahead. I just think he hit good matchups, um, but post rotation, no strong energy, no max elixir. Uh... I'm not too confident Honestly, I feel like, in it. I feel like Scorched Earth is the biggest loss, because without that, how are you reliably dumping your energies for Zygarde to get back? Right. At this point, the only really op the really easy options would be an Ultra Ball or Acro Biking and, and getting lucky. Acro Biking Prey is not how I want to run my decks. Right. Kind All of right. sad that its life was so short-lived. Like, it literally debuted at Worlds and then, you know, died that same week, which kind of sucks. It did debut, I think, in Australia something. Uh, yeah, Clive had yeah. topped, like, four different events in the Oceania area with Zygarde, but no one took it seriously because they were smaller events because the area is not as populous. And granted, I believe the player that played it was the same person at, at Worlds. I think he was really the, sort of, the, like, the vanguard of the deck. He was. Yeah, that that was, like, his pet deck since it had come out. Because if you go on to his uh, Limitless profile, uh, like, all the events that he's topped, except for, I think, like, one, uh, was all with Zygarde. All right, so last, the most important card to come out of Forbidden Light. Actually, there's two important cards. Let's let's be more fair. Uh, it's, um, first is obviously Malamar. So Malamar has mainly two variants, Ultra and Psychic. So have you guys been finding more success with one or the other? And what are your opinions of, of both of them? They're both good, but I like Psychic Malamar better because it's more consistent. Yeah, you don't really have to uh, find that metal energy like you do with um, Ultra Necrozma. I mean, Ultra Actually, Necrozma, no, it's slower. The meta is slower now. Um so you you have a bit more time, I, I guess you would say, to find that metal for it. But yeah, Psychic is just way more consistent, and that's usually what wins is what's more consistent. Uh, so at least for me, I've been talking to a few people. Uh, I originally was a big advocate for Psychic Malamar, but I've sort of started coming around to Ultra Malamar. And at least for me, what was explained is that Ultra Malamar, it's... A Malamar deck only really in the late game. In the early game, it's more like a a 
beast ring deck so much like how buzzwall works out in the early game which you really give up your first buzzwall to activate your beast rings similarly malamar sort of gives up your first one to start hitting really quick numbers and if you do anything in the first few turns then that's just like an added bonus uh also psychic malamar you know one of the bigger better matchups last season was obviously the buzzwall matchup and since that that deck's viability or popularity has come down a little Ultra Malamar hits cooler numbers. Uh, granted, you know, there's there's really a debate as to how important consistency is for you. But at least for me, the importance of Ocos are just so high that um, Ultra Malamar is actually really worth a consider. Right, Ultra Malamar is still a good deck, but I think the best thing for both Malamar variants is the loss of Parallel City. Because that card could just destroy your dreams in a second. I, th- I think Malamar was the, one of the decks that probably lost the least. Obviously, Parallel City and Bridget were big, you know, kicks to the face. But, um, I mean, it's obviously still doing well. And I think out of the two variants, I definitely think Ultra is stronger just because of the fact that it does hit better numbers. All right, cool. So next, let's move on to Celestial Storm, which is which was the newest set until today, which is uh, when Dragon's Majesty released. Um, so let's start with Shift Tree. Have you guys been working anything out with Shift Tree? I haven't exactly found much success with it, but uh, I hear it's it's pretty popular with some people. I'm not a fan. I haven't touched it. Nice pun there. I see. Not a fan. Get it? Because it's yeah. Shift Tree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. Shift Tree. I, I, once you once you set it up, it's just so high maintenance to try to maintain your hand size while also attaching twice to a stage two. So yeah, what if you can do that, the numbers are really good, but like you have all these moving pieces and trying to set up next turn, but also not playing too many cards because then you can't hit your numbers. Okay, to be fair, at least I feel that Shift Tree was better in last uh, last season because of now you don't feel as punished for playing Judges. <laughs> at least that's the only thing I can think of. But the problem with the judge is that you have to play it at the end of the turn. You can't play a supporter to try to dig for anything and then also judge to put your hand size at the same thing. Right, so it still suffers from the same problems, I suppose. I think Shiftry is cool, like, in terms of concept. Uh, you know, we haven't really seen a card like that since, like, Yen Mega, where it depended on your hand size. But I think it's a situation where, since you're pairing it up with Zoroark, it's a matter of, you know, there's better things to pair up with Zoroark. Uh, you know, obviously, exactly. Pod hits the same things for weakness, and it's much more consistent. It's much easier to get out, so I think that's why we don't see much shift tree. All right, cool. So next is Bennett. So Bennett had some sparing use at Worlds, mainly with that Shrine deck, uh, that Buzzwall Baby, Buzzwall Garbodor Shrine. I'm sure there's a better name, but that's what I'm going to call it for now. Uh, so after rotation, I've pretty much seen that people have dropped Bennett completely, even in those uh, Shrine decks. What do you guys feel? I've seen a lot more, Z- or I mean, I'm not gonna say a lot more Zorark. I've seen a lot of Zorark, uh, you know, in post rotation, and Bennett just loses to Zorark. Absolutely. Okay, so um, obviously the most important card from Celestial Storm is Rayquaza, which is, for many people is the BDIF at the moment. So. Although there was technically two versions, one is a more turbo with a bunch of acro bikes uh, and really just playing a bunch of Rayquazas as possible in the first. The biggest strengths are uncapped damage, and it can one-shot literally everything in the format. There it is. <laughs> All right, let's start with uh, Scoop, and then we'll go with Blackguard. Yeah. Rayquaza doesn't care. It just stacks its energy and does whatever it wants to you. <laughs> Blackguard, go ahead. Yeah, Vika Ray is just a straight upgrade from Vika Bulu, which is a deck that's done, like, very okay and put up just mediocre results ever since it came out, but this deck doesn't throw away its energy and doesn't have a cap on its damage, so it just, honestly, is kind of better in every way. Also, the GX attack is consistent. You can do this play where you treasure from Shadow and then Tempest, and they're at 4 and you're at 10, so... So actually, jumping off that comment, I, I'm surprised I forgot about Bulu, but um, is there actually any advantage to playing Bulu over Rayquaza? 
weakness, and that's it? I don't think so. so. All right, guys, I was just going to add one more thing. I think the, the biggest thing about Rayquaza is that I do feel that it's fairly fragile compared to everything else. It's, it's very easy to one-shot. There's a lot of things that can one-shot it in the meta right now. Um, and obviously, you know, if you get rid of the Vika Volts, it still stands kind of a chance, but for the most part. Then also, the fact that it plays a ton of items also makes it a bad matchup against Garbodor, but I think it just hits so fast and so heavy. That's why it's the best deck in format, despite having so much uh, potential weaknesses. And you're not right. as worried about them taking out the Vika Volt unless they can do it immediately, because once your energy's on the board, it sticks. So killing the Vika Volt is great. Kill Vika Volt, but I still have nine energies. That's true. Even one turn with the Vika Volt is scary. Absolutely. All right, sounds good. So although the set technically just released, we have seen some of the new Dragon, Ma Dragon Majesty cards. Is there anything inside that you guys have been looking forward to to help, you know, sort of alleviate the problems that some of the other decks have right now? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't really found anything to alleviate any problems, but one deck I really want to try out is uh, Fire now. Uh, just because there's some cheeky plays you can do with it with some of the cards that came out. Um, Tini is crazy. I know uh, Rukan was talking about it on Reddit a little bit uh, a while back, but like one of the cool right. plays with that you can do... One of the one of the cool things that you can do with it is uh, the Reshiram GX. Um, basically, just stack your board. Um, so turn one Kiawe on a Reshiram. Uh, turn two Fiery Flint for four energy. Use Reshiram's GX uh, to hit 180 damage, and then put those four energy on a Ho. -Oh, or sorry, it it does five. Uh, so put four energy on a ho -Oh and like get an energy on a Victini Prism Star. Uh, and then uh, turn two, uh, if your Reshiram gets knocked out, uh, knock something out with ho -Oh, which hits 180. And then once you get all those energies in your discard, uh, you can just clean up with Victini. Which, it, it seems fun. I don't know how good it's going to be, but it's one of those fun decks that I just want to try out. Yeah, it's it's cute, but I don't know if it's going to be consistent enough. It's it's a wild card, is what I'd say it is. Dragon's Majesty, to me, I think the most interesting card is Altaria. I know there's a lot of hype around it. I know, like I, you know, you go on PTCGO, go to the trading post, everyone's freaking looking for an Altaria. But uh, I think it's one of those cards that if it does become popular, it's gonna have to force pretty much everyone else to find, even in mirror matches. To find a way around it just because it does it does grant that immunity to Altaria. So I think it's a really interesting card, especially you got damage buffers like the other Altaria. You have cards like Lance that allow you to have a total of six Altaria, you know, you know, like a combination of like GX and the baby. Um yeah. Alright, well that's cool. Uh sorry, right, so we pretty much looked at every deck, at least that are on my radar. Uh, is there any deck that I missed that you guys feel that we is worth a discussion? I want to talk about Weavile. Oh, okay. Uh, is this the rule of evil, or is this e uh, evil, uh, evil admonition? Zoroark Weavile, I think, is a really good sleeper deck in this format. I say sleeper, but people are talking about it. But I think it's really good. Oh, yeah. most. Uh, it's it, You're talking about the one that hits everything with abilities, correct? It's more for everything with abilities. It's 50 times abilities. The okay, all that one. All right, yeah. for, okay. So yeah. obviously in last season, uh, the reason why that deck didn't find as much success is that people can either parallel city away your, their own things or just play more conservatively. But with the BDIF being Rayquaza, and it's not like Rayquaza can not play a Rayquaza down to play the game, uh, I can see why it's worth a consider. Because yeah, three abilities plus choice yeah. band kills Rayquaza, so that's like Rayquaza, Lele, Vika Volt, and Ray is knocked out. Right. It's so like, easy. Requ the Rayquaza match, like literally every Pokemon they play has an ability except for Grubbin. Yeah, exactly. So you're you're gonna hit big numbers with that one. And you, you eat Malamar for, variants alive. Going further, he also has an excellent matchup against Malamar. 
Uh, I think its weakest matchup is obviously Buzzwool, but that's been on decline. Yeah, the problem with Weavile originally was that it came out and it was good when Ultra Prism was new, but then Lucario came out immediately after that, and then Buzzwool got a bunch of support in Forbidden Light, so it just kind of fell off because of fighting weakness. All right, apart from Weavile, is there anything else that's, you know, really on, on the tip of your tongue that you... I got one more if no one else has an idea. Okay. Uh, all right, so we have looked at all the decks, but now I want to be a little more specific in regards to deck building. So I'm going to name a few things, and I just want your opinions on this. Let's start with Field Blower, which at one point in time was actually, you know, a must-of. Most decks would play at least two. I think the only exception that didn't play any Field Blowers was actually late late builds of Buzzwall. So nowadays, I've actually cut Field Blower from most of my decks. What have you guys been doing with Field Blower? Getting rid of them completely. Uh, yeah, I've been cutting them. Like one, maybe two in Zoroark decks, but that's just because Zoroark can afford to have a card that doesn't do that much. And if it's not relevant, just trade it away. But if it is, you can get value out of it. All right, next, I want to talk about Malamar decks. So Malamar has, you know, obviously a few obvious attackers like Dawn Wings or Ultra Necrozma if you're playing that, uh, and Marshadow. Apart from that, though, what do you guys have been working with in terms of other attackers? Deoxys. I'm guessing that's the attack Deoxys that has the same uh, function as Evolution's Mewtwo? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that, that, yeah, and he also has a secondary attack that's uh, pretty, uh, it's kind of, it's okay. <laughs> I think it's yeah, 120 and 130. I think it's 120, discard one, if I remember right. I think so. Okay. I think that's definitely a good one prize attacker, aside from Mimikyu, that Malamar could, could definitely run. Uh, yep. Next is let's let's talk about energy, re you know, not energy retrieval necessarily, but bringing back energies from your discard. Is energy recycle system something that's on your radar? Not unless you're playing Bulu. Really Even then, I, I still feel like Bulu. Bulu is still going to play energy recycler though. Um, it was better, huh? It was five as opposed to three. Yeah, because who oh, doesn't okay. need the energy in hand usually? Yeah, I was I was mixing them up. I thought I thought, I thought the the cycle system had the same effect, but never mind. No, it's uh, energy recycle system is uh, a rescue stretcher, stretcher for energy. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Uh, right. I mean, I could see playing one in like an ultra necrozma deck. Uh, you know, use the first ability to get a metal out of the discard to put on an ultra. Um, but aside from that, like any deck that like wants to get a lot of basic energy back, you'd rather use the uh, energy recycler to shuffle five back rather than. But one of the things that is obviously the most important ad adaptation we've been working with is obviously the loss of have lost uh, the ability to bring out three easy basics from your deck to your to your bench. Uh, so mainly we've been looking at things like heavier counts of uh, Nest Ball and Lily. We've been looking at Pokemon Fan Club. We've been looking at Apricorn, Apricot, Apricorn. I'm not quite sure which one it is. A Apricorn Maker. Uh, what do you guys have been working on in terms of your more standard strategy? Or do you think it's a more situational kind of thing now i've been playing zorart decks uh right now post rotation because i like to draw cards uh so first turn um like play your hand down and then lily to eight to basically get whatever you need is really good uh and then uh you zork i feel is like one deck that can actually get decent use out of the apricorn maker uh, because then turn two, you can Apricorn Maker for Timer Balls to get your evolutions. Uh, and then that helps thin your deck to make your trades more effective. Um, but I feel like for every other deck, um, you're going to want 
Lily over Apricorn Maker as your turn one supporter. Yeah, Lily's Even just stronger Zorg. in general. Yeah, I agree. Even with Zorg, I found myself sometimes getting myself into bad situations with Apricorn Maker, you know, where I can't draw out of it. Uh, so I would say overall Lily is stronger. All right, so a little while back, I made a, a post on Reddit called 20 Things I've Learned from the New Rotation. At least the name is something around that. And uh, one of the things I got a lot of debate on was actually the effectiveness of Liza, uh, Tate and Liza. What do you guys feel about the deck, uh, about the card? I am extremely upset that... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not upset. Okay, when it, when I was first released, I was genuinely convinced that it was going to be played in every single deck. Then it came out, and I found that I wasn't even playing it. It's just the thing about it is that that switch effect, well, it, it seems cool in theory. A lot of the time, you don't really want to waste your turn on just switching. So I think that's kind of... And then the whole shuffle, draw five, I think there's just overall better supporters you could be playing. I think our supporter lineup is thin and weak enough that Tate and Liza becomes an okay card. Because, I mean, the versatility is still there. And there's still points at which you say, hey, Floatstone's not a card anymore, so I'm stuck in the active. But on the other hand, Shuffle Draw 5 is strictly worse than Cynthia. But every other draw supporter is worse than Cynthia too. So what are you going to do? Another, The only one of those 20 points I've actually, you know, sort of fell back on is actually the importance of uh, resource management or Zorak decks. Have you guys played around that card? Have you guys enjoyed that card? Or has it been a letdown? I've never struggled against that card. I played a little few games with it and used it a couple times. It's cool and it works, but I don't know if it's just in a in a meta where there's very few mill decks or control decks. I don't know if it's better to just use your resources wisely. Yeah, everything in this meta right now is basically like just try and set up to one shot everything, uh, or in the case of Zora or Glissopod, two shot. Um, so you don't really want to waste your turn resource managing when you can be taking knockouts. All right, I think that's a fair point. And last thing that I want to talk about in terms of card choices is the your preference from escape rope and switch. Which guys have you, which one have you guys liked more? What reasons do you have to like one over the other? I've always preferred Switch. I think Escape Rope, obviously, they get to choose who to send out, so they'll just send out someone that, you know, either can't get knocked out or they don't mind if it gets knocked out. Uh, I'm a little more biased towards Escape Rope because when I, like, really got into competitive was when Escape Rope was really big in the meta, back when, like, a Veltogarb was the best deck. So I think Escape Rope is a good card. I like being able to disrupt, like, what they're trying to do, especially in a deck like... Uh, like a deck with spread options, like something that plays Latios or like Greninja GX, where you can sort of pick off their bench anyway. But yeah, Switch is still just the the more reliable card because it just gets what you want active, whereas Escape Rope is kind of just messing with them. I feel like like I'd rather play Switch just because I like controlling what's in my opponent's active. Um, but like. Escape Rope does, you know, pair pretty well with Guzma. So if they, like, Guzma stall you, uh, you can Escape Rope, um, and then they're, you know, going to put something else. I don't know. I, I feel like Switch is just the better option. All right. I, I, I mentioned this before. I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I think Altaria... Before I move on, like, what do you guys think of that deck? I haven't really looked at it. I, I briefly looked at it yesterday. Uh, I mean, that first attack is pretty good to block uh, GX attacks. What's the attack cost on it? It's like Fairy Colorless, isn't it? First attack is Fairy Colorless. Her second attack is Water Fairy Colorless. And her GX attack is Fairy Colorless. Okay, so the attack cost isn't too bad, and the dragon support that we got out of Dragon Majesty is all right. So I can see Altaria being relevant, but I don't really know how relevant. 
Yeah, so I guess the point I was trying to make is depending on how relevant it is, we could see escape rope being, you know, being played more uh, just because, you know, to work around that immunity that it's going to get, you know, force them to basically take something out that you can hit instead of an immune Altaria. So, yeah, I just, I just kind of want to add that point. There's also the Guzma combo where you escape rope it to the bench and then Guzma it back up and then the immunity's gone. You can attack it. Right, Absolutely. and at the very least, you know, although that attack is very neat, we've seen other similar attacks such as, you know, Glaceon EX back in the day or uh, Reggie Ice back in the day. And even now we can find similar cards in Alolan Ninetales, the Baby One, and Hoopa. And, you know, just because of the presence of Guzma, it's hard to talk about the viability of this card. Because unlike the other two babies that you could play to stop GXs, uh, this one, yet you have to attack. It's not an ability, so Guzma can just bring it back up. Either way, I think it's a really neat card, and the fact that it has a fairy weakness is uh, pretty decent, although it might also suffer from the same... You know, just because Rayquaza is so popular, people might be attacking for that in terms of, you know, Fairy Lele or, or the Dene, and it just might get brought down in the cro in like the crosshairs. That's true. I never considered that. So actually moving on from that comment, have you guys been trying uh Fairy Lele or Dedene in terms to beat Rayquaza? Dedene is amazing. Uh, I've been playing Dedene. That is awesome oh. in the Zoro cards. Yeah, because you already play Coco. And Zora Weavile, you can play Unit Energy, and that lets uh, Fairy Lele do work without needing Coco. But other than that, unless you're playing like Rainbows or something, then Dedene is probably the better option with Coco. I just, like, with me, uh, with uh, tech attackers like that, uh, just like I always preferred Mew EX over uh, Mewtwo Evolutions, uh, because I like being able to control the one-hit knockout uh, with it being my decision and not what my opponent does. Because with Fairy Lele, they have to have a fully stacked Rayquaza. Uh, but with the Dene, you can take the one hit knockout on you. Like if you're going second and they went first and they have a Rayquaza in the active, you can one hit knock that out on your first turn, which would be the second turn of the game uh, with the Dene. That's true. But on the other hand, the difference between Mewtwo and Lele is that uh, Buzzwole with one energy is still jet punching, whereas Rayquaza with one energy is doing nothing. Right. But still relevant. Right. So that's a super neat point. Uh, so we've looked at pretty much everything, and keeping in mind everything we talked about, obviously if we were to be real competitors, we'd be probably booking our flights to Philadelphia. So let's imagine you were, and you were going, and you had to make a deck choice. What would you guys actually consider so i want each of you to give me your first choice and then your pet deck so let's start with uh Lycanator. i think just because i have been testing it a lot zoropod i feel it has really good matchups um can't really think too much of an auto loss that it has um again you could take into dene for equaza since it's going to be huge and for a pet deck uh I've been also testing Zora Greninja a lot. It's not the most consistent, but it's a really fun deck, and I feel it could give some results, but I don't, I don't see it anytime soon. All right, and let's move to Scoop. Uh, Zoro Pod, uh, just, I've been playing a lot of it. I played a lot of it last season. Uh, so, you know, you just play a deck that's comfortable with big tournaments like that. Um... And then pet deck would be uh, Zoroark Decidueye. Uh, just have fun, <laughs> I guess. Uh, I don't. I don't see that one winning too much, but I like Decidueye. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, Decidueye's got that pretty good GX attack uh, to get stuff back. Um, you know, in in this meta where we don't have a lot to get like your DCEs back or anything like that. Perfect. And Blackguard, what about you? Oh, I would uh, I would choose a Zoroark variant because I just feel like not playing Zoroark at a regional is asking to lose because you brick. 
And my top two variants would be either Garbodor or Revile, because I think they both have good Rayquaza matchups, where while being strong as everything else in the field. And for a pet deck, it's absolutely Metagross. Like, that deck is stupidly fun All to right. play. Well, at least for me, my first choice would probably be Zoro Garb, because I feel as in, much like Zoro Pod, it has an overall good matchup against most of the decks. And then for my pet deck, actually, it's uh, Glaceon Mac Cargo, which I've been having a lot of fun with. I don't think it's quite as good, though it does, you know, if you get a Glaceon out early enough as you, on your first turn, you do completely shut down Rayquaza, which is pretty neat. Apart from that, you know, it's 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 a fun deck. Which Glaceon right, so are we talking was... about here? Excuse me, sorry? Which Glaceon is it? It's a GX one? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Glaceon GX, the one that blocks all abilities while it's active of other GX and EX Pokemons. Okay. All right, I was making sure there wasn't, like, another <laughs> Glaceon I didn't know about. I think that's the only one. The yeah. only one that's available in Standard, yeah. So, yeah, so uh, we pretty much ran through most of the decks that at least I can think of and some of the decks that other people have added uh, after hand. Uh, we looked at some of the tech choices and sort of card choices that we could do. Is there any closing thoughts you guys have? And if not, we're just going to wrap everything up. So let's start, you know, reverse alphabetically with uh, Scoop here. Uh, not really too much anything else I want to say. Um, we pretty much touched on everything I think that was important post-rotation-wise. But uh, just go out there, have fun, play your League Cups. And your League Challenges, now that they're important. Right, play your league challenges, get some points. Try to get some points. All right, next is uh, Lycanator. Cool. So um, we brought up a lot of good points, but I think this is definitely something that's going to happen, happen again once the next set comes out because that's going to change the meta dramatically. You know, we have things like Professor Elm's Lecture that, you know, is way better than Fan Club, Apple Corn Maker, or Lily. It's going to shut down that argument. Um, but... Overall, yeah, I really like where the meta is right now. So I think it's really balanced, which is a good thing. And finally, Blackguard? Um, play for an S-Ball. Pick one deck and get really good with it. And just good luck to everybody. And at least for my closing thoughts is that, you know, nothing we say here is necessarily law. Uh, it's obviously you have to look at your local stuff and, and work out things accordingly. And luckily, at least for now, in the new world, in the new world that we are living in, uh, there's no necessarily a right or wrong answer. And with that, I hope everybody had fun listening to us for sort of ramble on, not necessarily, you know, going out of our way to, to give you the most hard hitting information, but trying to get as much as things as possible. And uh, I just like to give this moment for all three of my guests here to give a shout out if they want to give a shout out or just closing thoughts. So once more, Blackguard. Um, no, nah, nothing in particular. I did get to meet Seagrove at North American Internationals. And that was fun. He's a really cool guy. Shout out to nice. him. Nice. All right. And uh, Lycanator. Shout out to Pramawa for that amazing Zoropod deck list. <laughs> yeah, that list, you know, looks pretty good. Uh, and finally, Scoop. Uh, definitely.